Greetings, Valley Bible Church. It's good to see you this morning. For those of you who are usually in our first service, welcome to our second service. Wait, what's that? Oh, this is the first... What, would we, what did we do earlier? Okay, can you just cut that part out and we'll start again? Okay. Greetings, Valley Bible Church. Welcome to our first service of Valley Bible Church. Um, we're doing things a little bit differently this morning. Next week, we will have a laugh track to tell you what is funny and what is not, when to laugh and when not to laugh. Um, actually, uh, this is a bit sad this morning to be in this empty auditorium, except for just a few people. Um, it's sad. It's historic. Um, Doug Snook, one of our elders, you know Doug, uh, said as far as he knows, other than canceling for uh, church in the park or... Um, gathering at the river for a camp. Um, This building has never been shut down via external circumstances. So it's a bit sad uh, to be here in this empty building and to speak to you. It's unnerving, too, because um, I like seeing you all here, and I like being able to to see your faces as we're talking, because it is to be a bit of a dialogue and and not just me preaching at you, but uh, teaching God's Word in the midst of, uh, of the saints. So... It is sad that way. We are scattered this morning because of the coronavirus and the mandate by the governor to to not meet if you are a group larger than 250. We don't know how long this is going to take place, but we will do our best uh, in the midst of these unusual circumstances, and we are we're going to soldier on, and we're going to bring glory to God. Um, some things that are happening, uh, obviously, I'm doing some announcements right now. Uh, Late Friday afternoon, the elders met, kind of an emergency meeting responding to the governor's mandate, and so we will not be meeting until that mandate is lifted. We will not be meeting on Sunday mornings. But uh, all of our other, most of our other um, uh, activities will continue. Yesterday, we had a great turnout for the um, uh, men's breakfast in spite of the weather, in spite of the, uh, uh, the slowdown of everything due to the coronavirus. Um, this Tuesday, our men's theological study at 6.30 will continue to meet. So guys, if you're missing fellowship this morning and you'd like to come, we'd love to have you this, this uh, Tuesday. Um, life groups are continuing to meet. Uh, youth group will continue to meet on Wednesdays. We do want you to know that the spring luncheon for the ladies has been uh, rescheduled to May at this time. All of this, of course, is provisionally uh, until we know uh, further Uh, how things are going to progress. We also have a congregational meeting planned for the end of this month. Uh, At this time, that's up in the air. If things slow down quicker than we think, then then that'll be great. Um, But otherwise, we'll probably plan on rescheduling that as well. So we're in flux, uh, but God uh, God will not be moved. Um, He is our rock, and our trust and our hope is in Him. Uh, we hope that during this time you'll find creative ways to, to pray, to gather, to minister to one another, to minister to our community. Um, if there are elder people in your life group or that are at risk due uh, to the virus, uh, reach out to them and help them. And we want to find ways that we can continue to be the body of Christ, even though we're scattered, we're not gathered this morning, but we want to find ways creatively to pray and to minister. And so... Uh, when you uh, gather to watch this message, do it as a family. Maybe it's something you can do together. We're used to coming together, and I encourage you to, to get together as a family and watch it together. Um, we often tell you that uh, watching the sermons online is, is not a substitute for worshiping together, but we are called to worship individually. Every one of us, uh, we are to uh, revere our God. We are to love Him and to serve Him and to follow Him and in every way. And so watching the sermons and being involved in the Word of God is a way to do that. Um, But um, corporate worship is something that is so important and it is mandated throughout the scriptures. It is a time where we, as a body, with one voice, we glorify God together. And so we will be coveting that time and looking forward to that time that we are together. In the meantime, meet with your life groups And that can be a bit of a worship service as well. Um, If your life group does not do singing, maybe you can add that element to your your life group. Um, Do some singing. Of course, there's prayer, there's fellowship, there's study of God's Word, and there is no reason why your life group cannot do communion together. I encourage you to do that, to um, 
It'll be a sign that you are identifying with the rest of the church at large that are meeting in homes. That's what they did in the early church. And we, uh, we ask you to do that. So there are many, many cre- creative things that can happen. I think we're going to learn a lot. I think we're going to grow a lot. I think God is going to do some remarkable things uh, through this, this uh, trial and this plague that is upon us, if you will. And so uh, we encourage you to stay tuned. The best way to get information will be the website. We will have some banners that are uh, on there giving information, uh, updates about events. If you have not signed up for the life group, uh, for, rather for the, the newsletter, uh, call the church. And uh, we will have regular office hours uh, during the week. But call the church or send an email to uh, uh, vbc at spokanevbc.org and ask to be added to the mailing list. And um, if you are listening and watching and you're not part of a life group, um, you can also uh, contact uh, Caleb at spokanevbc.org and say, I want to be part of a life group. We'll get you in a life group this week. There's no reason why we cannot do that. So we'll find many, many creative ways to, to keep moving forward. So with that, <clears throat> with that, we will pray, and uh, I would like to uh, bring your attention to the fact that our, the President of the United States has declared today to be a day of prayer. And so if there is anything that we can do today, it is to pray uh, for our nation, uh, for our city, for our world, uh, for healing, for uh, wisdom and guidance, for this uh, virus to be arrested and done away with but also for God to make himself known in many, many ways. So would you join with me as we pray? We are grateful, God, for this uh, beautiful, crisp, uh, white day outside where the snow is beautiful. And we ask, Father, for your grace, for us, for our church, our families, for our nation, for this world, that Christ would be seen and known in the midst of uh, these dark days, Uh, that the sun still shines and Jesus is still on the throne. We ask that you would gather our people together as a church, as a family, that you would use this time to grow us deep in our faith and our understanding of church and family and our purpose and our mission here in this valley. We ask, God, that we would be changed by these events and that you would be worshipped and that you would be glorified In all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Savior, amen. Our passage this morning is uh, John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 9 through 15. And so I'd like you to read along with me, uh, John chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. We know the story so far. Nicodemus um, has um, been talking to Jesus about what it means to be born again. And the last thing that Jesus said to Nicodemus was, well, the wind blows wherever it will. Uh, You don't know where it's coming or where it's going. And so is the ministry of the Spirit for those who are born again. It is mysterious, but it it uh, it is definitely something that we can see. And Nicodemus says in verse 9, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know And testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And God's people said, amen. (laughs) Hope you said amen at home. So I want to look at um, last week what we saw. Uh, We saw that salvation is impossible to achieve on one's own. Um, Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, uh, oh, you're a great teacher and we know that you're from God. And Jesus turns it right around and says, this is not what you need. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. But as a legalist, according to the law, as a Pharisee, it's impossible for you to do. We also saw that salvation requires spiritual cleansing and spiritual rebirth, because the second truly, truly, Jesus said to him, unless you are born of water and spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. 
This is something that is spiritual. You need cleansing on the inside. This is something that comes from outside of you. This rebirth you cannot do yourself. And we also saw that salvation is a mysterious work of a sovereign God. This is all something that God does. It's the blowing of God's spirit, and that's the only way that it can happen. And so Nicodemus uh, was told, you must be born again, and that's what we saw as well. But what we are going to see this morning is that we need to accept the truth that has been given. Nicodemus did not uh, accept the truth that had been given to him. And Nicodemus said to him, well, how can these things be? And uh, real, literally what, it mean, what he says is, how is it possible for this to happen? How can I be born spiritually? It's almost similar to the Philippian jailer saying to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Because he's just been told, you can't do it yourself. It requires spiritual cleansing and rebirth. And it is a sovereign work of God. And so Jesus is not done explaining to Nicodemus. And what he is doing is he is leading him to faith. He is leading Nicodemus to faith. How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Uh, incredulity is met with incredulity because Nicodemus says, well, how can this be? How is it possible? And Jesus says, well, how is it possible that you don't understand? You are the teacher of Israel. That doesn't mean he's the only teacher of Israel, but he is a teacher who is well known. He is the one that people would go to. Hey, you need to go to Nicodemus because this is the guy who knows. He is a teacher. He is the teacher of Israel. And so he is recognized as one who knows the scriptures, who knows the, the law and the prophets, and he is one who can be trusted. And he said, you are the teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things. This is an important thing to, under, to, to see, that uh, he did not understand what was, what was going on. This is an important word, understand. You don't have the knowledge to understand this. These are things that you should know because you are a teacher of Israel. And so Jesus gives the, the third truly, truly statement. And this is the reason that, uh, that Nicodemus does not understand these things. The first truly, truly statement was, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you will, you will not see the kingdom of God. The second important statement to Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless... You are born of water and spirit. You will not enter the kingdom of God. And now he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. The bottom line is this. Nicodemus does not accept. It's not a matter of, he's moving from understanding to acceptance and he's moving Nicodemus to faith, and he's going to get to that in a minute. But at this point, he says, you don't accept the testimony. You don't accept the witness that has been given. One of the questions we have here is, Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, plural, plur pronouns, and you, plural, do not accept our testimony. Jesus is hearkening back to his first statement, Nicodemus' first statement to him, where he came to Nicodemus and he said, uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we, plural, know, representing the other Pharisees, we know that you've come from God because nobody can do these things unless God is with him. And now Jesus says to him, well, you know a few things, we know some things too. And the things that we know, you have not just understood you have not accepted them as true. Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter and he is going to move uh, Nicodemus from understanding to acceptance to belief. So, what are these testimonies? What is Jesus talking about? Whose testimony we're talking about? If we look forward uh, a little bit, we can see this. The first testimony is the testimony of Jesus himself. John 8, 14, Jesus answered and said to them, guess who he is? He was talking to, he was talking to the Pharisees. 
Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from or where I am going. Jesus himself is a testimony. John the Baptist was a testimony. John 5.33, you have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. This word testify is really important in the book of John. And these are the testimonies uh, to Jesus and, and the fact that he has come from God. And when we get to, to chapter 5, we'll go through these even in more in depth. Jesus, John the Baptist, the works of Jesus himself, John 5, 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So when, when Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, we testify of the truth, these are the we that he's talking about. The testimony of the Father, John 5, 37. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. It's a matter of faith. They don't believe. Nicodemus doesn't believe. It's not just Nicodemus. It's all the leaders. And Jesus is addressing them through Nicodemus. And there's more. Testimony of Moses and the prophets. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. These are the things that testify about Jesus Christ. And that's why when, when Jesus says, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? I say to you, we know what we testify of, what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. You've rejected it. And the lesson for us, we too, like Nicodemus, must respond to the truth that we have been given. The truth that we've been given. What was the truth that Nicodemus had been given? What should he have understood? He should have understood that salvation was not something that he could achieve on his own. That was never the teaching of the Old Testament. Salvation was always by grace through faith. He should have understood that the Spirit of God had a role in the cleansing of his people from sin. He should have understood that there was an anticipated time of messianic blessing where God's people would be given a new heart. He should have understood these things. And he said, you as a teacher of Israel, do you not understand these things? Come on, Nicodemus. Haven't you read Ezekiel 36 and 37? Jeremiah 31, 32, and 33. They didn't have chapters back in those days. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 59. Joel 2, you don't know this stuff. You're the teacher of Israel that tells all about the cleansing of our hearts by the Spirit and our hearts being made new, new in the messianic age that has come. You don't know. This is what we're all about here as Jews. This is what it's all moving toward. And we too must respond to the truth that we have been given. And how much truth have we been given? We've got a lot more truth than Nicodemus had. We've got Bibles on our shelves, it shouldn't stay there. Bibles on our nightstands, it shouldn't just stay there. It should be in our lap, on our kitchen table. We have sermons, we have Bible studies, we have men's groups, ladies' groups, life groups, sermons online, sermons on the radio. We have to pay attention to the word that has been given. When we have been given light and we respond to it, we will be given more truth. The reason... Nicodemus didn't understand was because he did not respond to the light that was given to him. He didn't accept that testimony that was given. And so <clears throat> those who deny the truth are not going to be given any more truth. But those who respond will be given more and more, and we are responsible to respond to the truth that God has given to us. A second lesson then there is this. Lean in to the Scriptures. Lean in. When you are reading your Bibles, when you are listening to a sermon, when you are preparing to, for participation in a life group, don't be passive. I know it's easy to come on Sunday mornings and say, 
Tell me something I don't know. Make me laugh. Make me write something down. Instead of leaning into God's word and leaning forward, wanting to know that what he is saying, we must find out what God, God's message is for us. We must believe that that message is true, and we want to lean into it. Look at uh, Ezra 7.10. It said, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. You know what Nicodemus was missing? Heart. You know what Nicodemus was missing? Practice. When we are given the word of God, we're responsible for that truth that is given to us. We are responsible to live it. And I can't tell you how uh, much that weighs on me. Every single week when I prepare God's word, I am responsible for this truth and this light that is given to me to not only just tell you about it, you guys need to live it, and I don't. That's, what, that's pharisaical. But it's my responsibility as it is your responsibility as it is our responsibility to set our hearts to study God's word and to practice it and even to teach others. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, there is a sense in which we all, we all have the Holy Spirit. We have a responsibility to teach and admonish one another, and one of the ways that we do that is with the theology and the truth of the hymns and the songs that we sing, but we need to, be, we need to, we need to mean it, we need to practice it. And when we sing, we need to sing with understanding. And when we are at life groups, we need to know what God says, and we need to share with one another what he is teaching us that others might be taught as well. And so lean into the scriptures because God has given us a lot of truth and we must accept the truth that has been given. Nicodemus did not, but we must respond to that truth. So we must um, accept the truth that has been given and in verses 12 through 13, we must believe God's message from heaven. Believe God's message from heaven. He says in verse 12, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? The key word here is believe, ladies and gentlemen. How will you believe? Notice he says, you do not believe. The, the contrast is not so much earthly and heavenly. What is the contrast? It's between unbelief and belief. So we're, we're moving, you see Jesus moving uh, Nicodemus from uh, understanding... That's a T, not an F. <laughs> to accepting to belief. It's all about faith. The issue is faith. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe any of the things that he's been studying. He doesn't even believe that they're true, maybe. Teaching it is one thing. That, that, again, that is part of uh, uh, being pharisaical. Earthly things... Uh, what Jesus is talking about, the, the, the contrast that he is making with heavenly things, is all the things that happen on this earth. The things that happen on this earth, uh, all the things that happen in the, in the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the things that happen in the history of Israel, even being born again happens on this earth. But it's all pointing to a heavenly reality. These things happen. That's why he says no one ascended into heaven. As we're talking about where is the truth? Where does the truth come from? It comes from heaven, from the one sent from heaven, who is Son of Man. It's all about believing the message and the messenger. He's saying, you need to understand 
that I came from heaven. It's one thing to understand the, all of these other witnesses, but there isn't anybody who has ascended into heaven but the one who first descended from heaven. Uh, this phrase, descending, uh, ascending into heaven and descending from heaven, is found many times. It's found in the story of Jacob. Uh, it's found, found a couple of other times in the Old Testament. It's found uh, in uh, John at least twice. Um, it's found in the book of Proverbs. Um, and it always is in this order, um, ascending into heaven and descending from heaven. You'd think it would be the other way. Someone would descend from heaven and go back into heaven. That is the point. Jesus is the only one who's done that. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, taken up into heaven. He didn't die. And he ascended into heaven. But he didn't start there. He didn't start in heaven. Who started in heaven? The only one who started in heaven was Jesus. He is the only one who came from heaven in the incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he is the only one who ascended into heaven. And here Jesus is speaking in the prophetic past here. It hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. He is going to ascend into heaven, incarnation, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension. He came down. He went back up. He alone is the messenger from heaven. So he is tell telling uh, Nicodemus, I alone am uniquely qualified and only qualified to tell you heavenly things. There is no other. There isn't anyone else who can tell you these things. He speaks with cred credibility and authority on this issue. This week we had our uh, trip to Israel. Um, it has been... Uh, uh, taken away from us. It was canceled. And it was really disappointing because I've never been to Israel. In fact, I don't even know if Israel exists. I mean, it, all those photos, they might be a hoax just trying to get me to think that it's real. Except that I know a guy named Rex. Rex usually sits right down here. Hi, Rex. And um, Rex has been to Israel many times. And when I talk to him, there is passion about the Holy Land. And he tells me stories through eyes that have seen and experienced. And he knows that Israel, it's not like me talking to my neighbor. And I'm tell, I tell my neighbor, uh, I'm taking a trip to Israel. And my neighbor says, well, let me tell you about Israel. And they go on and on and on and on and on. And I say, so have you ever been to Israel? No, never been there. I'm going to stick with Rex because Rex knows Israel in similar fashion it is only Jesus, he is the only one who has been to heaven, who has come from heaven, and can speak these things to us, these heavenly things. He alone is the one who has come from heaven. And that's why, look at, look at Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know, Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. Surely you know who this is. Oh, you don't? He's leading him to faith. He's leading him to understand that he is the one whom Proverbs 30 spoke of. He is the only one who has a, a message that is valid from heaven. He is the only one who has come down and is able to go back up. He's the Messiah. He's the promised one. A lesson for us, oftentimes, I should say, hey, this is cool being able to do this. I can make, it's our, our greatest error Note the error. I did that on purpose. Our greatest error is not misunderstanding, but failure to believe. It would be one thing for <clears throat> Jesus to just totally cut Nicodemus off because he didn't understand. He gives him a mild rebuke because he should know these things. But Jesus is very patient with him. He's leading him through this conversation He's leading him to faith. He's told him about what it means to be born again, and, and still it does not compute. Because he's, Nicodemus is saying, well, I, 
I might be able to understand what you've said so far, but what does that mean for me? What is my response? And oftentimes our greatest error is not what we misunderstand, but failure to believe. And sometimes we understand all too well. We do understand. We just feign misunderstanding. I don't understand the scripture. Yeah, yeah, really? You know the old Mark Twain quote? It ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. We do that as Christians. Unbelievers do that. Oftentimes when people claim that they don't understand, they understand all too well. They just don't want to accept it and believe it. How important it is for us to Accept the truth and believe the truth and not claim or feign misunderstanding or ignorance. Because what we know and what unbelievers know when we tell them the gospel, salvation is grace by faith, but there are demands of discipleship that Jesus puts on us. Nicodemus would have known that. If I'm going to follow the Messiah, if I'm truly going to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... That means I can't be like the crowd of the Pharisees. It means I need to be a true worshiper. It means my heart needs to be engaged in the scriptures. I need to be obedient to practice God's word, study it and practice it and teach it to others, having lived it myself. And when people hear the gospel, they instinctively know when we talk about sin that sin must be repented of. It must be acknowledged you're right, God, I'm wrong. And that, that intimates that you can't continue. That he must be your God. And a God is to be worshipped and followed and loved. And anything that has our place of affection and direction and our, and our resources and our love and our time becomes our God. Ronald Nash said this, If we understand a person's God to be that which is one's ultimate concern, then there really is not such thing as an atheist. What is your ultimate concern? What what grabs you? What captures you? I've heard people this week saying uh, on news broadcasts, well, I'm going to stay in. It's going to be a Netflix weekend. That's okay. A little bit of that. We don't want to waste this opportunity. Yes, I think part of this is God causing us to slow down, but to what end? Just to watch movies? Read books? Maybe God's books? Pursue truth? Make this an opportunity to be a worshiper and to to believe in these truths. Second lesson is that the words of Jesus can be believed Because he is true, and his words are true. Even non-Christians have respect for Jesus, right? They just don't know what he said. They just think they know what he said. You know, love everybody, you know, forgive everybody. That's why having someone read the book of John is so powerful that in the very words of Jesus, because people have respect for Jesus, why? Why? He's the only one who came from heaven. He's the only one who died for our sins. He's the only one who raised from the dead. He's the only one who went back into heaven. And people have a respect for Jesus Christ, but they don't really know what he says. That's why people might say, are you one of those born-again types? And we can say, these are the words of Jesus. If you have respect for him, like most people do, listen, accept, believe. And for us as well, not just understanding the, the, the scripture, and that we do a lot of that. We, we spend a lot of time uh, doing exegesis and a lot of time studying and a lot of time trying to understand what the word of God says. But do we believe that it's true? Do we believe the implications that it has on our lives, that it's more than just saying, I filled up another notebook, I'm good to go because I know more stuff. That's what our culture currently is based upon, knowing, just knowing things. Google it. Do a search. Okay, I know this now. No, you don't. 
Knowledge is the beginning and the fear of the Lord. The knowledge of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but it has to start with the fear of the Lord, not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. So, Jesus can be believed because he is the heavenly message and he is the heavenly messenger. So respond to the truth that you've been given. Believe God's message from heaven and trust to God's Son who is given in verses 14 through 15. Trust God's Son who is given. Jesus ends this in a very interesting way. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. As this, so that, even so, rather, as this, even so, so that. Here, and here it is. As Moses was lifted up, lifted up the serpent in the, in the wilderness, even so, in the same manner, must the, must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that, here's the purpose, that he was lifted up. Whoever believes. Whoever believes. He is leading Nicodemus to faith. Leading Nicodemus to faith. Moses was the mediator between the nation of Israel and, and God. This story in Numbers 21, uh, verses 6 through 9, what happened... Uh, Israel had just had a great victory over the Canaanites. They, they had had uh, war with them, and they'd cried out to the Lord for deliverance, and the Lord uh, delivered them, and they, everything was, they, was, was great because God was to be praised. And then they resumed their journey, and they got impatient, and they got impla- complaining once again to the Lord. And so this is what happened. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Against the Lord and you. They recognized and confessed their sin. And so looking to Moses as the intercessor, as the one who would be mediator between them and God, intercede with the Lord so that for the purpose that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Notice what the request was. He may remove the serpents. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent... He lived. What was the prayer request? Remove the serpents. Remove the serpents. Did God remove the serpents? Nope. He answered the prayer in a different way, didn't he? What he provided was salvation, if you will. He provided a way of of healing. Moses made a bronze serpent. It's, it's, a, it's an odd story, isn't it? That he, he takes this standard, this staff, and he makes a bronze serpent. And if someone is uh, bitten by uh, this snake, he holds it up. And all you got to do is look at it. Is that all they had to do? It wasn't just looking at it. It was looking in faith, wasn't it? It was a matter of belief. Because God said, here is the thing that you need to do to be healed from the the venom of the snake, by faith, look at what I have provided for you. Do what I say. Believe in my provision. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, serpent, he lived. He lived. What What do the serpent... And the Savior have in common. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
Jesus took the poison of sin upon himself. He took the venom of our sin upon himself. He is the sin bearer. He didn't take it away right away that our sin would be taken away when we believe in him. Our part is to accept that truth, to believe in the messenger, and to trust in his work. The whole package, incarnation, redemption, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. We believe that he was lifted up. Why he says back, if the Son of Man be lifted up, later in John, we'll come to it later, he's going to talk about this several other times, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The lifting up is is speaking of the cross. He is the standard. He is the one who is nailed to the cross. He's not a serpent, but he bears the venom of the serpent. Isn't it odd to look at a snake which represents Satan and the very uh, entrance of evil into the garden? But it represents that Jesus defeats that sin. For he on the cross had the wrath of God poured out upon him, just as the Israelites had God's wrath poured out upon them by him sending the fiery snakes, and he provided a way for physical healing. But he provides something greater, not physical healing, eternal life. Eternal life. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So he's taken Nicodemus from, I don't understand. No, you don't understand. You don't accept what's true. The reason you don't accept it, you don't believe it. But if you do believe it, that the Son of Man is going to be lifted up, and he is going to be the sin bearer, then you can believe. And you can have eternal life. And this is what he's talking about, is saving faith, not just believing that it is true. The old theologians used these three words, notitia, ascensus, and fiducia. Saving faith is made up of notitia, which is knowledge. You have to have the knowledge of the gospel. I'm a sinner. God exists. Christ died for my sins. He's the Son of God, and he rose from the dead. A census. You have to assent to the fact that it's true. You believe that it's true. You believe the message and the messenger. But then, fiducia. Trust. Saving faith involves trust. It's faith not in a body of truth amongst the Pharisees. It's uh, not faith in just knowing the scriptures of the law and the prophets. It's not faith in our own righteousness, our church denomination, our church affiliation. It is trust in the person and the work of Christ. Do you believe that he is the one who came down and went back up? Do you believe that he is the one who took the venom, the poison of your sin upon himself, that when you look to him, you will have eternal life. That's what it is. Entrusting ourselves to Christ. Falling back into his arms. On Thursdays, Chris often brings Noel to to work and she helps him with a lot of different things. She's helped run cable and she's helped uh, this last week uh, setting up for the next class and Chris and I were talking, and Noel was there, and she just loves her daddy, and she's just falling all over him, and just leaning back, and he's grabbing her, and as we're talking, she's smiling, she's such a joy. And at one time, in the, at one point in the conversation, uh, as you, we are wont to do in conversations, Chris kind of stepped to the side, and Noel leaned back and almost fell, and, and Chris reached out and grabbed her. That's what a loving father does a son or daughter that he loves, we lean back into him, we entrust ourselves to him. That's what saving faith is. Knowledge, assent that it's true, and entrusting ourselves to him. 
made me think of this great old hymn, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, What a Blessedness, What a Peace is Mine, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, Leaning, Leaning, Safe and Secure from All Alarms, Leaning, Leaning, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim path, pilgrim way, rather, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Life groups, sing that this week. Nancy, I expect that you are already, the wheels are turning, and you will have uh, the song sheets ready for us on Thursday nights, and I appreciate that. We should all sing that song this week because... What a greater lesson at a time like this. We must lean into the truth. We must lean into the everlasting arms of our Father because only Jesus is adequate and worthy to be trusted for eternal life and life on this earth. Is there any, anyone else? Is there anything else you can trust for? For eternal life, but also life on this earth, what we're going through right now, no one, nothing else. He is the only thing and the only one. So some final thoughts. Um, What is God doing right now? It might be something you can talk about in your life group. What is he doing in our world? This is a worldwide pandemic. It's, It's affecting everyone everywhere. What's the purpose of the plague What is it? What is he doing in your family? What is he doing in your church, our church? What is he doing in your life? I'm, if, time out to watch Netflix? Is there something greater that he's wanting to do? Like I said at the beginning, I think we're going to do, see a lot and we're going to grow a lot. Here is the long answer to this. glory. It's all about him and his glory. Somehow, some way, we cooperate with that. He will be praised among the nations. He will, whether they rage and whether they are are fearful, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, he will not be moved, nor will we. He's doing marvelous things right now. We don't want to miss it. It's historic, but it's also powerful for the gospel and for his glory. Pray. National Day of Prayer. Make sure you spend some time today praying. And with that, I will pray. We're grateful, God, for your grace to us as a church as a nation, the light that you've given to this nation throughout church history, those first pilgrims who came to escape religious persecution and how the gospel grew through the great awakenings. Many times, in many ways, your spirit has moved to bring people to repentance, and we pray for that. May it start with us. May it start with our own individual lives in our families, in our church family, that you would use this as a way of causing us to turn to you to, in repentance. We know that's the purpose of the plagues. That we would walk in holiness, that we would be people who are repentant, that we would give honor and glory to the one who made us. 
And so we pray for opportunities and ways in which we can reach out to our neighbors and those who don't, do not know you and reach out to one another in ways that, are, uh, that we could not do at any other time. We look forward to seeing you work in great and mighty ways. And we look forward to seeing your glory on display. In the name of Christ, amen. We will see you next week.